It's great to be here. So you probably, I, you know, you, you, you may have looked at your, um, at that um, little poster and said, Gary who? So I thought I would bring um, some pictures. I don't know if you can see all of those, some pictures to kind of capture um, this person who's going to talk to you for the next hour or so. And so um, let's see, up in the right-hand corner, that's Tammy and me. So Tammy and I met here at Pepperdine, or here at Pepperdine, here at uh, Harding. <laughs> Whoops. And... Um, <laughs> In fact, we had our, um, uh, she kissed me for the first time um, in uh, front of a house that was called the Dykes House. Um, now it's just a parking lot. I'm kind of offended by that. There's no plaque or anything, but um, so that's where we met, dated, and um, let's see. This is, you may not be able to see this, but this is us in the lower left-hand corner. That's Tammy and me on a mission trip um, in France, southern France. Uh, we have two sons. Uh, Joel, our oldest, is 30, and our youngest, Tyler, is uh, 27. That's me marrying um, Tyler, and then uh, that's me sitting with Joel and Ashley right before their wedding. I, one of the rich privileges of my life was marrying two of my sons, or both of my sons, off to two wonderful women. Um, let's see. I love coffee. I've had a little bit this afternoon. Um, I live uh, on the campus of Pepperdine, and so um, I look out over the ocean um, every morning, although I do think this is, this is actually more beautiful than the view that I have. But, um, and that's a Photoshop. I have not learned to surf yet. It's one of my goals, but it's been 10 years, so it may not happen. I don't know. We'll see. But, um, so that's just a bad Photoshop of me surfing. Uh, got involved, and this is, um, I had a long connection with Mark Moore, and, um, who was kind of this, this is part of his brainchild. And um, Mark and I were involved in dreaming of an East Africa Study Abroad program and, uh, and got to be a part of starting that. And one time I was in Kigali, outside of Kigali at a craft market, and looked, and here was this guy selling candy with a Pepperdine shirt on. So somebody had donated this shirt, and it's found its way to Rwanda, and um, there was this guy, let me take a picture with him, um, standing in front of um, kind of a, a road, dirt road, everything. So, so that's a little bit about me, and I wanted to give you just a quick word of encouragement. This isn't really related to my talk, but um, this something that was shared to me, one of the memories I have of being at Harding was um, being a part of a small group that was going to go, we were going to tr- go uh, plant a church somewhere in the Northeast, and um, I don't know if you get anxious about what am I going to do for a job, what's, it, what's the future going to look like, but we were really uptight, and we met with um, a couple named Carl and Frankie Mitchell. Do you guys know the Mitchells? Anybody know the Mitchells? Some of you will know the Mitchells. And um, we were kind of expressing our anxiety about what are we going to do, and will, will anybody hire us? And, and she looked at us and she said, you're the cream of the crop. And you're just going to be, you're going to be just fine. People are going to be falling all over themselves to hire you. Um, it'll work, it'll work out just fine. And I remember thinking, yeah, it's easy for you to say. Um, but I look back from the point where I am now, and I think, well, she was right. Um, it has always, you know, God has always given us what we've needed. Um, I think about how I ended up at Harding. Um, I was actually kind of a little bit wild in high school. I, Christian education was not part of my, my plan at all. And then the uh, early June, I went out to this, um, to this church camp that I've been a part of uh, as a younger child, kind of met Jesus again, had a conversion experience, decided maybe I should go to a Christian college, talked to a friend of mine uh, who was a little bit older, kind of a mentor, and I said, well, I'm thinking about going to a Christian college. Where should I go? And he says, well, knowing you, knowing, this is outside of the Washington, D.C. area, he said, I think you ought to go to Harding. I said, okay. So I came home the next morning. I thought, well, maybe I'll go for a year to Towson State University outside of Baltimore where I was supposed to go and then maybe transfer. And that morning I woke up, Monday morning, I thought, you know, if I don't go now, I'll, never, I'll probably never go. And so I told my mom, I think I want to go to Harding. Uh, this was like the beginning of June, long past when you should ever apply for college. And she got on the phone and they sent an application and they let me apply and they, I, maybe they were desperate for students that year, um, but they let me in. Fall of 1977, came to Harding. And um, what a blessing that was for me. My, my, I can't imagine what my life would look like if that hadn't happened. A um, couple years into the Harding Graduate School, I was driving, um, uh, commuting from Augusta. I lived in Augusta, Arkansas, uh, commuting toward the Graduate School. And a friend of mine that I was riding with mentioned that there was this church back in the D.C. area where I was from who was looking for an associate minister. He just kind of, a, just sort of an offhand mention, you know, and I think, I, I, you know, well, I, I I thought, wow, let me find out about this. I went and asked about it, got the letter that they had sent. Um, Tammy and I talked about it. By Monday, my resume was in the mail, and they hired me. I ended up going to the D.C. area, working with this church for three years, 
and then planted another church, spent uh, almost 20 years there. And I've, I've often wondered, if, if Steve had been about to tell me this, and a flock of birds had flown up or something and distracted him, and he hadn't told me, you know, what would life have, have looked like? But there it was. Um, I went through a period in the early 1990s where I'd been in full-time ministry, and I just knew I needed to make a shift out of that, you know, and I just couldn't see myself doing full-time ministry anymore. And, um, but I'd been, you know, I was like in my mid-30s, pushing 40. This is all I'd ever done. And um, no one wants to look at a 40-year-old minister for a job. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I thought maybe I could teach. And so I contacted um, a bunch of community colleges that were advertising for adjunct positions. And if you know anything about academia, community college adjunct positions are the bottom. You know, it's like if you can't get in there, there's no hope for you. And I could not get community colleges to call me back about their adjunct positions. So I had this one desperate summer of, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm pushing 40, I have a mortgage, I have two kids, and there's nothing else I can do. Um, but by a quirk of networking and the work of God, I got a community co college adjunct position 70 miles away. Um, I lost money on the job, but at least I got in. And within two years, I, I had a tenure track position at George Washington University without having to go on the market, without having to leave my house. Um, you know, and so I, and I think after 10 years there, we, um, uh, youngest son was graduating. We'd always known about Pepperdine. This door opened up for us to go out to Pepperdine and the stuff I've gotten to do since then. It's just incredible. I, I feel like my life is a miracle. Um, I never would have imagined that um, I would have gotten to do the things that I've done. And so and when Frankie said, uh, it's easy f it, that, that things are going to be fine. You're the cream of the crop. People will will hire you, opportunities will be there for you. I thought, ah, oh, it's easy for you to say. Uh, now I look back and I realize she was right. And so I'll say to you, students, that what she said to me, um, you are the cream of the crop and um, doors will open for you. Um, you're going to be just fine. So now I want to clarify my title. Okay, it's a little different from what you saw on the poster. I'm going to assume that that was a, a misprint or maybe they just ran out of room. Um, so the title is Eating and Drinking, Music and Dancing, Embracing an Earthy, not Earthly, but an Earthy Kingdom of Heaven. Um, those phrases are from the Gospel of Luke. Eating and drinking, that is what, that's the charge that's made against Jesus. At one point they say, look at this guy, he's eating and drinking. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And then music and dancing is a phrase that comes from the, the story of the prodigal son. When the older brother comes home and there's something that clues him in that, that, that a party is going on in the house of his father. He hears music and dancing. And it's about the earthy kingdom of heaven. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Let me tell you about an experience that I had the summer after I graduated from high school. Um, I was at the home of actually my, my former girlfriend. Um, that's another story I don't have time for. Um, but her, her name was Hannah Mossman. And um, her family had been kind of a second family for me. And so I was close to her family. Um, her father was the town doctor. Um, her older brother, Andy, was one of my best friends. And I have this vivid memory of sitting around their dining table in their dining room, a little farmhouse in rural Maryland. And I think um, I, we had had some event that morning. Her father, Dr. Mossman, um, organized like this little brass band, and I was a part of it, a fireman's band. And we had at some event, a uh, parade or something that morning that we had played for. And then we were back at their house. And I have this vivid memory of sitting around the Mossman's dinner table. And Dr. Mossman is there, and um, Andy, her older brother, my one of my best friends was there, and uh, my older brother, Fred, who was also a brass player, and we're just sitting around this, this um, dining room table, and I have this vivid memory of just laughing, just laughing and talking. Um, I, I, rem I can just still see Dr. Mossman throwing his head back and just letting out this, this um, gush of laughter. And as I look back on that, I think the thing that strikes me is how disconnected that moment. It was a moment of joy. It was a moment of intense. It was mundane, but in other ways, it was a, it was a moment of such intense well-being. But as I look back on it, 
the thing that strikes me is how disconnected it was to my life of faith. Here is this moment of pure bliss, pure joy. Um, you know, most of the time we're so self-conscious. We, we worry about what we look like and smell like and what other people think about us, you know. But this was one of those moments where I was just lifted out of that in a, into a, this glimpse of just pure well-being. And yet, it was totally disconnected from the life of faith. My life as a Christian, my life with the church, was in a totally different direction. And I've, I've always wondered about that. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I remember it. Um, I've always wondered about, you know, why, was, why were my moments of greatest joy totally disconnected from my life as a Christian? And I've, I've spent the last 35 years or more thinking about that question. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I've learned since then. As we think about eating and drinking, music and dancing, embracing an earthy kingdom of heaven. So to begin with, let me tell you about an experiment that was recorded a couple years ago in a journal called the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Here's the way the experiment went. The subjects, there are three groups of subjects. Um, each group of subjects was given the same visual discrimination test. And the way that works is you're given two pictures that are almost identical in every way except for just some slight variations. And your, your job is to pick out as many variations as you can. So three groups, all doing the same visual discrimination test. One group um, was given a white coat to wear before they actually performed the discrimination test, and they were told that it was a painter's coat. So each person would put the coat on, the painter's coat on, and do the visual discrimination test. The second group was shown the um, white coat, and they were told that it was a doctor's lab coat. Okay, they didn't put it on, they just were shown the coat, and they were invited to think about the symbolic connections between the coat and what the coat represented. You know, doctor's really, really smart. The third group was told that it was a doctor's lab coat, but in this case, each person would put the coat on before he or she would actually perform the visual discrimination test. The results were astounding. The group that did the worst was the group that put on the coat thinking it was the painter's coat. Just ahead of them was the group of people who made the cognitive connections between the coat and what it symbolized. They didn't put it on, they just thought about it. The group that far and away beat out all the others was the group of people who actually put the coat on and performed the test. They put the doctor's lab coat on. And the researchers concluded that these results came from two things. The first, of course, was the symbolic meaning of the coat itself. There is a difference, symbolically, between the painter's coat and the doctor's lab coat. But even more important was the physical experience of actually wearing the doctor's lab coat. There was something powerful about doing more than just standing outside and thinking about the symbolic connections but instead actually living those connections in the moment. And this points to a whole um, area of psychological research dealing with a phenomenon we call embodied cognition. And the idea is that our bodies matter. What we do with our bodies shapes our thinking and our emotions. We are embodied creatures. We're not just thinking machines. And that's how God made us. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when we come to the Bible, we never just sit and take in abstracted knowledge. We never exist in some kind of disembodied state of spirituality. Instead, we kneel and we kiss and we lift holy hands and we bow and we shout and we cry out and we sing and we dance. We taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, hold on to that. We're going to come back to that. Um, I want you to think for a moment about some of your experiences of joy. Maybe you have your own experiences like what I experienced uh, sitting around the Mossman's dinner table. Here are three of mine. The first is a cabin high in the Sierras. It stands in a small valley ringed by mountains that are crowded with pine trees that give way to granite cliffs. 
The sky is a deep blue. The air is cold. There's snow on the ground. I can, I can feel that, that snow that is kind of crystallized crunch underneath my feet. And I can see my breath. And as I walk, I catch a scent of pine mixed with wood smoke. A second glimpse is an Adirondack chair overlooking the ocean. And I hear the rhythm of the surf as, it, as waves break on the shore again and again. And I feel the ocean breeze as it caresses my cheek. The sun is warm on my face. And the smell of the sea brings back a flood of memories from childhood vacations at the ocean. Third glimpse, I'm surrounded by my family. It's Thanksgiving, or maybe Christmas. And the house is filled with the sound of conversation and laughter, the smell of food. You know what I'm talking about. You have your experiences? Do those ring a bell for you at all? Let me ask you to do this. I've been talking for a little bit. Let me ask you, turn to your neighbor and share an experience that, uh, of joy that kind of matches the kind of things that I've been sharing. Let's think about this for a moment. Go ahead and talk with each other for just a moment. All right, let's pull back together. So were you able to share a memory, an experience of joy? You know what, do you know what I'm talking about? Not if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. All right, make sure you're out there. Um, so for me, just seeing these pictures, I'm thinking about those moments, creates such intense longing in me. And it aches, it stabs. I, I want to be there so badly. Um, and I know what it's like to look forward to those moments. In fact, part of the joy is just the anticipation. Part of the richness. I look back on those as some of the richest experiences of my life. Um, and what's striking to me is how much those experiences are embodied. They involve our bodies. They're almost always tied to physical sensation. They're not just ideas. They're not just concepts. They are sensuous experiences. What evokes that longing are sights and smells and tastes and temperatures and colors and sounds. What's also striking to me is how fleeting those experiences are. You can't hold on to them. You know, they're here for an instant, and then they're gone. It's like they always point beyond themselves. Whatever we're glimpsing in those moments, it always seems to be around the next bend or over the next rise. And yet we have all known those. I've been talking about these for years, and I've never had an audience who said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. We, we all experience that, that ache, the stab of joy, the sense of unfulfilled longing. And we struggle what to do with it. Uh, some of us just keep looking for it in the next experience, the next relationship, the next possession, the next achievement. Other people try to deaden the longing. Just lower your expectations and accept that it doesn't exist. But what if, what if, what if those experiences that come to us 
in tastes and smells and sights and sounds and touch, those sensuous experiences? What if those are glimpses of the purpose for which we were made? What if they point not to ultimate frustration, but instead to ultimate fulfillment? Isn't that a tantalizing possibility? That maybe God isn't calling us away from those. Maybe those are the appetizers for the feast that God has in store for us. What if the reality is something like this? There's a party going on in the next room, and we're outside the door. And and maybe we, we live in so much darkness, but maybe a little bit of light is coming out from around the door. And and we smell the smell of death and corruption all around us. But maybe in those moments we're glimpsing a little bit of the banquet. And we hear we're surrounded by noise, noise. But what if in those those moments we're, we're catching just a little bit of the sound of music? What would it mean to live with that hope that someday, God willing, we shall get in? And if you're a Christian and this is your hope, think about the news that you have to share. What if this were our message? Think about what it would mean to say to your friends who are not Christians, to think or to ask them, think about your moments of greatest longing. Your moments, your glimpses of bliss. What if those are a pointer to the purpose for which God made the world? What if those are a glimpse of the fulfillment to which God is taking all of history? Now, sadly, there's an abundance of evidence that suggests that that is not our message. Whatever else the world is hearing from us, it's not that. A couple of years ago, you may have seen this book, uh, David Kenneman, who works with a public opinion firm known as the Barner Group, wrote a book called Unchristian. And um, what his firm did, they, they conducted surveys, they drew on other research, um, surveyed thousands of people, and drew on other research that surveyed thousands of people to try to capture the attitudes of people your age and slightly older toward Christianity. What do people think about Christianity? And what they found was disturbing. Our research shows that many of those outside of Christianity, especially younger adults, have little trust in the Christian faith and esteem for the lifestyle of Christ followers is quickly fading among outsiders. They admit their emotional intellectual barriers go up when they are around Christians. And they go on to write that Christianity's image problem is not just a problem of outsiders. Even those who have not left the church continue to have this same kind of negative attitude. The perception that Christians are hypocritical. They don't really care about people. All they care about is converts. If you're not a potential convert, I have no use for you. They're too political. They're too judgmental. And note here, Kinnaman is not telling us to give up our convictions. He said, in fact, if you're going to be salt and light, you need two things. You need purity and you need presence. Well, having said all that, I challenge you to get... Get his book and read it. It's a wake-up call, I think, for the church. But here's what really hit me. They found, they said, we have become famous for what we oppose rather than what we are for. Another attitude, Christians are boring, unintelligent, old-fashioned, and out of touch with reality. Only one-fifth of young outsiders believes that an active faith helps people um, live a better, more fulfilling life. And church has no spiritual verve. Two-thirds of young outsiders said that the faith is boring. So on the one hand, we've got this tantalizing possibility. On the other hand, this is the impression that many of us um, have of the Christian faith. A couple of years ago, uh, Pepperdine um, hired a a branding company, uh, the Shook Kelly firm, to come out and look at Pepperdine's brand. Okay, and um, they're a pretty high powered group. They actually uh, did some branding work for Whole Foods and for um, Harley Davidson. You know, one of the that's one one of the strongest brands in the nation. And so they were just coming out to see, well, what is Pepperdine really all about? You know, and and how could Pepperdine discover its 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 real mission? And how do we put that out there to the world? 
But as a, as a part of that process, they kept coming across this Church of Christ thing. And these guys, they didn't care one way or the other. Um, they're just trying to figure out what's going on at Pepperdine. And so they, they kept coming across this Church of Christ thing. And they started asking, you know, what, what's the Church of Christ? Um, and after doing a lot of conversation with people, um, they said, well, th this is what we're finding. This is the impression that you have given about your church. You are the church of, guess what? You're the church of no. That's the impression based on their interviews that we of the Church of Christ are giving to the branding consultants. You're the church of no. And so that's where we are. We have this tantalizing possibility that our moments, our experiences of bliss are pointers to ultimate reality. And yet somehow we seem to live in such a way that gives a very different impression to the world. And it's kind of like me sitting around the Mossman's dinner table, having this moment of this glimpse of well-being that was totally disconnected from my faith. Now the question I've asked is, what's behind that? And part of the problem may, def may be um, in how we define what it means to be spiritual. What does it mean to be spiritual? So if you think about the average Christian's perspective or per uh, perception of what it means to be spiritual, you might ask the question, who's more spiritual? So who's going to say, uh, who's, the, who's the more spiritual person, A or B? Well, we're probably going to say A. Okay, yeah, not the old guy on the surfboard. Or who's more spiritual, A or B? Well, we're going to say A. And that's not to say those are not good activities. And yet we automatically go to the place that sees the spiritual as divorce from the physical. That spirituality involves greater and greater distance from the material. We have a very Gnostic view of spirituality. That spirituality means living more and more inside our heads. And so we go to church and we pray, help us remove from our minds the things of the world. And I think what that means in our minds is help us to, to, to focus totally on theological ideas, theological concepts. Now we might have a potluck afterward, but we're going to dismiss God first. And so we live with what some have called negative spirituality. And the person who really helped me understand this was C.S. Lewis. And I'm going to talk about, he's going to um, inform a lot of what I, need, I want to say to you. Negative spirituality, he called it a life without space, without history, without environment, with no sensuous elements in it. In this view, he said, we feel, if we do not say, that the vision of God will come not to fulfill, but to destroy our nature. This bleak fantasy often underlies our very use of such words as holy, pure, or spiritual. This, what does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to be holy? It's this negative spirituality. And he said, you know, that is an unhealthy way to live. Because what it does is it forces us to live with a dichotomy between whatever spirituality is, whatever we imagine the life of Christ, life in Christ to be, and the physical reality that, that every moment presses on our senses. As he put it, we seem to be nearest to the vision of God in this life, or, or when we seem to be the near, nearest to the vision of God in this life, the body seems almost irrelevant. So on the one hand, we think holiness is over here, and yet it's a total remove from all that is a part of our lives physically. We try to generate feelings of spiritual fervor in response to theological concepts. Grace, holiness, the supremacy of Christ. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but sort of maybe sitting in church, and I'm trying to, to, to generate some kind of fervor in response to an abstraction. And I can't seem to do it. Dial doesn't seem to move. We lose the fervency of hope. Believing heaven, Lewis says, to be a merely a state of mind, our hold on the virtue of hope languishes. Where our fathers and mothers peering into the future saw gleams of gold, 
We see only the mist, white, featureless, cold, and never moving. So that's, um, that's the idea of spirituality that many of us have grown up with, negative spirituality. The idea that you are becoming more and more spiritual the further you move away from your body, from physicality. Does that make sense? Making sense? Okay. Um, so that's the dilemma. Our richest, uh, deepest experiences of joy and pleasure are often connected to sensuous experience, our bodies, and yet we have this sense that spirituality means, means moving further and further away from our bodies. And it's no wonder that it doesn't seem like we have much of a message. Now, when you take that understanding of of spirituality as the negation of the physical, and you come to the life of Jesus. I think Jesus totally blows that out of the water. His ministry is embodied. It's physical. It's earthy. Not earthly, but earthy. He walks. He sleeps. He cries. He sweats. He touches. Think about how often he reaches out his hands to touch people. When he heals a blind man, He grabs a handful of dirt and he spits in it and he makes this mud paste and he puts it on the eyes of that person he's about to heal. He has a body and the body is integral to his ministry. In fact, it's interesting when you read the story of the ascension told at the end of Mark and at the end of Luke, you find this really odd statement. He is taken up to heaven. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. He's taken up. In other words, it's not like he dematerializes. It's not like he goes back to a pre-incarnational existence. Somehow he still has a body. Now, it's not the same body that he had before, but it's enough of a, it's enough of a body that he is taken up before them. There's still an element of physicality to existence, to his existence. So, in the face of our own conception of Negative spirituality. Jesus is earthy. He is physical. He is sensuous. And nowhere does that come across more clearly than when it comes to food, to eating and drinking. Now hear me on this. I'm not just going to glorify food or eating, although I could do that. Um, For Jesus, I think food, eating, is a pointer to something greater. But the fact is, when you work through the Gospel of Luke and you realize how much Food and feasting and eating together play a role in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Food, that physical experience is central to his ministry. It's what gets him in trouble, but it is also the moment, oftentimes, when he is recognized as the Messiah. So some examples. We'll fly through these in the interest of time, but... Um, Luke chapter 5, 29 and 30, after he calls Matthew to be an apostle, Matthew throws a banquet for all of his friends to celebrate, and Jesus is right there in the middle of it all. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, are aghast, and they ask him why he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. So it's the fact that he's eating and drinking. Of course, it's, it's part of the problem is who is, he is eating and drinking with. That's often a part of what gets him into trouble. Not just eating and drinking, but the company he's keeping as he eats and drinks. And yet, food, feasting are part of how he communicates the new reality of the kingdom. If you keep reading in Luke chapter 5, 33, 34, there you find that what gets him in trouble is the mere fact that he's eating and drinking. Verse verse 33, continuing that conversation with the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they compare him to John the Baptist, who is an ascetic, who is known for feasting and or for fasting and praying. And in their minds, that looks spiritual. And in contrast, Jesus looks like a partier, a rank hedonist. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? And Jesus tells them that the bridegroom is here. There will be moments of fasting, but in the presence of the bridegroom, this is a moment to celebrate. The next chapter, chapter 6, Jesus gets called on the carpet by the Pharisees because his disciples are picking and eating grain on the Sabbath. That's not a spiritual thing to do. It's far more spiritual to go hungry. Luke chapter 7, 31 through 35, Jesus is chiding the crowds for being so fickle. John the Baptist came fasting, and you said that he's got a demon. 
The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you said he's a glutton and a drunkard. There's something about the way Jesus lives. There's something about the way Jesus moves through the world that leads people to say, this guy's a glutton and a drunkard. Luke chapter 14, the parable of um, the extravagant banquet. And the thing that's so amazing to me is that the king is trying not to keep people out, but to keep them in. What is the kingdom of God like? It's a banquet. And the king's greatest disappointment is that he can't get people to come in. Um, if you're interested in Lewis, um, you want to read more about this, read the book The Great Divorce, where you find that the, 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 the lock on the, the gate of, of heaven is on the hell side and not on the heaven side. Um, I always thought that God was trying to keep us out. You know, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I really want to get to heaven if I could just get around God. You know, Jesus tells this parable of the king who is trying desperately to get people to come to the feast. Luke chapter 15, I mentioned this at the beginning, the parable of the lost son. Verse 25, what clues the older brother in that something's going on is when he hears music and dancing. Luke 22, when Jesus is about to go to the cross, he institutes the ceremony through which we will remember him and celebrate his faith, uh, celebrate his death. And it's the food and drink. Luke chapter 24, one of his post-resurrection appearances, Jesus appears among the disciples. And they're startled and they're frightened. They think it's a ghost. You see, they're prepared for a ghost. They're prepared for a disembodied existence. They're not prepared for a physical body that somehow appears out of nowhere. And Jesus tells them, come, look, look at my hands, look at my feet. It's really me. And they're not sure. And so what does he do? I love this. He looks around and says, you got anything to eat? You got any food around here? And they, well, we've got this piece of boiled fish. And they hand it to him and he eats it in their presence. And they know it's him. My favorite story is another um, post-resurrection appearance, also Luke chapter 24, the story of the two disciples that Jesus meets on the road to Emmaus. You remember that story? Um, Jesus comes up behind them. They've been in Jerusalem, and now they're walking back. Clo uh, Cleopas is one of them. We don't know who the other one was. Maybe it was his wife. Maybe it was a couple. I don't know. But they're walking back, and you can see... Um, if you were watching them, that, that they're downcast. I just imagine, you know, their heads are down, their, their um, shoulders are slumped um, as they walk back toward the town of Emmaus. Jesus comes up behind them, and they're kept from seeing who it is. And he comes up and he says, what are you talking about? What were you talking about back there on the road? And they say, you must be a visitor. You must be like the only person in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened. And they begin to tell um, uh, him about Jesus. And there's this phrase in there that has always haunted me. As they, as they tell him about Jesus, and they say, we had hoped. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, felt that. It's like, we had hoped. Jesus begins to tell them about the prophecies, about how what they have seen and experienced was actually what God had been planning all along. But they still don't really get it yet. And they're coming to the town, and it looks like Jesus is going to keep going. And so they, they beg him, it's, it's late, come, uh, come stay with us. And so they come in, and um, they sit down before a meal. And it's a, it's a kind of a Lord's Supper text. Um, he, he, take, he takes bread, and he um, takes it, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives them bread. And it says at that moment, their eyes were opened and they recognized him as Jesus. In the breaking of bread, they saw the Messiah. Now you pull all that together. I think we've been living with this sense of negative spirituality. Spiritual means moving further and further away from the physical. In the face of that, we find Jesus coming among us in the flesh. His ministry is earthy. 
It embraces, it honors the physical. The physical becomes a medium through which God reveals his glory, the presence in Christ. When he ascends, he doesn't leave behind physicality. Rather, the physical is taken up in the spiritual. And especially we see that in how much food plays a role in the ministry of Christ. Not just glorifying food in itself, but as one site for thinking about what it means to be spiritual. And what that says to me is whatever spirituality is, it's not simply divorce from the physical. Instead, the physical is a medium through which the spiritual, the reality of God, becomes present to us. And ultimately, just as in the ascension, Jesus is taken up into heaven. So also in the, the, the physical is taken up into the spiritual. Now tomorrow night I want to talk just briefly about how we practice that. What would it mean to pursue a spiritual life that reflects those, the implications of that understanding of physicality? But what I want to do just to end is to emphasize uh, two essential qualities that I think go into what it means to be spiritual. One of them is consciousness or agency, or consciousness or awareness, and the other is choice or agency. Spirituality means becoming um, ever increasingly aware, aware of the world, aware of the presence of God, aware of the people around you, aware of yourself, what's going on in your own mind, in your own heart. And then agency or choice, doing what you are doing more and more and more out of choice. Now, I'll flesh that out, that's a little pun, a little bit more tomorrow night. Um, What does it mean to live, um, even within our bodies, with greater and greater consciousness and choice or agency? For now, I want to end just with a couple of implications of this. Um, One implication has to do with the way we see worship. And I just want to touch on this. I think it's important. I won't talk about it a lot, but I want you to at least think about it. The role of our bodies, the role of of the physical, physical performance in the act of worship. One of the people that I recommend that you read, if you want to know more about it, is a guy named James K.A. Smith, wrote a book called Desiring the Kingdom. And he talks about um, the experience of going to the mall. And he says, you know, think about how the mall socializes us to a particular view of the good life. And it does that through uh, multi-sensory kinds of experiences. You see it, you hear it, you smell it. It's part of the architecture. All trying to get you to see, to buy into a particular vision of the good life. And then he says, now let's go to church. While the mall, he says, Victoria's Secret and Jerry Bruckheimer are grabbing hold of our gut by means of our body and its senses in stories and images, sights and sounds, and commercial versions of smells and bells, the church's response is oddly rationalist. It plunks us down in a worship service, the culmination of which is a 45-minute didactic sermon, a sort of holy lecture trying to convince us of the dangers by implanting doctrines and beliefs. The church still tends to see us as Cartesian minds. While secular liturgies are after our hearts, the church thinks it only has to get into our heads. Now, in our experience, we haven't totally eliminated our bodies. We still have baptism. We still have the Lord's Supper. But even those think about how much we tend to focus on knowledge and ideas and not about the physical performance. And when you think about um, the embodied spirituality that we see in Jesus, it helps me appreciate the crucial place of ritual, practice. Your theological ideas will not become real to you until you perform them with your bodies. We have to find ways to put the lab coat on. And I just want to say one thing in defense of a cappella singing as a way of performing our theology. Um, I have a lot of students from a variety of, of religious backgrounds, and, and they worship, um, in a lot, you know, a lot of them kind of gravitate toward a pretty typical evangelical worship. 
Um, and in evangelical worship, at least what I see uh, them participating in, the lights go down, the band starts up, and I, I, I've talked to my students. I said, I, I watch you in those moments, and it looks like you're kind of going into your own little private cocoon. You know, and, they, and, 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 and they'll say, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, you are totally inside yourself in that moment. And I watched that, and I, it's kind of made me appreciate a cappella singing in a new way. Now, um, some of the arguments I think we gave for a cappella probably don't work real well. I think they probably bend the text in ways that the text was never intended to say. But if you think about what it means to embody the idea of community, wow, there's very little that you could do that does that better than a cappella singing. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, a cappella singing is one of those where if you don't sing, it doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so you are embodied the, the idea of the priesthood of all believers. You can't consign it to the band. You got to do it or it doesn't happen. And if you think about in, in a cappella singing, um, you know, you kind of have to be vulnerable to sing, don't you? Now, if you have a band playing, you can kind of mouth it, you know, no one, you know, you don't really have to do it. But, but without a band to back you up, it's just kind of you, isn't it? And if you think about your points of greatest vulnerability, it's when you sing, right? So it's kind of like, you know, if your voice croaks or if you're off key, people are, you know, it's like you're really kind of, you're sort of out there. It's almost like standing out there in your underwear when you're singing. That's kind of the way a cappella does. And you think about when you sing in a, in a community like that, you kind of have to listen to yourself and you kind of have to listen to the people around you and you kind of have to match yourself with the people around you. So I'm kind of, I don't want to sing too loud, but I want to sing loud enough, and I want to sing in key with the people around. It's kind of like discerning the body, isn't it? Isn't it amazing how that ancient practice, for which sometimes in Churches of Christ we, we use as a club to beat people over the head with, is actually a beautiful bodily, physical enactment of the vision of the church, where we are discerning the body where we are, in some sense, being vulnerable to one another as we all take responsibility for this act of worship. Just one way of thinking about the role of the body in our acts of worship. So that's one implication. Thinking about ways of embodying our faith. But then the other one, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow night. Learning to see experiences of pleasure, experiences of beauty as glimpses of God's glory. What would it mean for the quality of our lives now if we were to live this embodied, earthy spirituality? If we were able to embrace every pleasure, every taste, every touch, every beautiful sound as a glimpse of the glory of God. When I was working on this, I was sitting out on my, um, on my balcony and I was kind of just working through this, you know, and, and I have a little fountain uh, on my balcony that you know, has the, just the, the little trickle of water. And um, there, was, there were some birds singing off and I just stopped for a moment and just, just listening to that water and listening to those birds and just taking that in as a tiny glimpse of the glory of God. What would it mean to live that way? What would it mean for our hope for the future if those experiences were tangible signposts pointing us to what awaits us? What if those pleasures that we experience that are gifts, coming in the midst of so much pain and corruption, what if those were our true glimpse of where God is taking the whole story? What would it mean for our witness to the world to be the people who know how to live well if we became the church of yes? Now, in my next talk tomorrow night, I will emphasize that living this way is actually hard work. It is a discipline. Um, I, I look out from my balcony 
over the Pacific Ocean. And yet sometimes I get so worried and busy with other things that I can go a week without even just looking up and seeing it. And so it takes constant vigilance to pay attention and to glorify God in those moments. And sometimes it is a discipline of saying no or saying not now. Or when I go through the buffet line, saying I've had enough. But more often, what if it were a discipline, not that turns away from the good things around us, but that welcomes them and makes the connection between them and the presence of God. In the breaking of bread, in mundane joys, to know God is here. 2006, the first summer after we moved to Pepperdine, I had both of our sons with us for the summer. And they were both in college at the time. And at the end of the summer, uh, my boys and I, we had to uh, get a car to the East Coast for my younger son, and we were heading for a wedding um, up in Maine. And so my boys and I took a road trip. We drove and camped our way across the United States, saw the Great Salt Lake, went to Yellowstone, the Grand Tetons, drove across the northern U.S., saw the Grand Canyons, camped in the White Mountains, and eventually ended up in Portland, Maine. And it was one of the richest experiences of my life. And that trip with my two sons marked the end of a chapter in my life. Um, they have grown, and um, they will never be with us in the way that they were when they were boys. So that kind of trip will probably never happen again. When Tammy and I got on the plane to come back to California by ourselves, it was almost like I was hearing a door slam behind me. And I feel sad about that. Part of me longs to go back to that time to which I can never return. And I'll tell you, if I didn't have God, and if I didn't have the hope of God's joy, that sadness would crush me. But now because I live with the hope of God's joy, I see that moment with my boys in a new way. Of course, I'm sad that they're not with me. But now I realize that that experience with my boys was never designed to fulfill me completely. Instead, it was a pointer to a deeper reality. And so I savor the memory, but I also savor the reality, and I imagine the reality toward which that brief moment points me. And so now, even as we live in the midst of struggle and disappointment, we have the possibility of savoring moments of bliss as the first fruits. Moments when we experience joy and beauty, when we laugh, when we feel peace and contentment, the sense of well-being, to realize that those are glimpses of heaven. They're the appetizer to a feast that awaits us. And so I end with these words from C.S. Lewis, from his book, Miracles. To shrink back, he writes, from all that can be called nature into negative spirituality is as if we ran away from horses instead of learning to ride. There is in our present pilgrim condition plenty of room, more room than most of us like, for abstinence and renunciation and mortifying our natural desires. But behind all asceticism, the thought should be, who will trust us with the true wealth if we cannot be trusted even with the wealth that perishes? Who will trust me with a spiritual body if I cannot control even an earthly body? These small and perishable bodies we now have were given to us as ponies are given to schoolboys. We must learn to manage. Not that we may someday be free of horses altogether, but that someday we may ride bareback, confident and rejoicing those greater mounts, those winged, shining and world-shaking horses, which perhaps even now Expect us with impatience, pawing and snorting in the king's stable. Not that the gallop would be of any value, 
unless it were a gallop with the king. But how else, since he has retained his own charger, should we accompany him? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this moment of considering the gifts that you have given to us. Help us to open our eyes, to embrace them, to welcome them, and to see in them your glory and your presence. In the name of Christ, amen. God bless you.